Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 28 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm James, and today I have with me... Sapumafu with the Krat Brothers. While walking in the woods one day, Chris and Martin saw something strange. A little leaping lemur who liked to bounce and play. They followed their new bouncing friend, not knowing where this adventure would end. The animals were headed just around the bend. Where are they going? I don't know. Well, how do we get there? Come on, let's go! Me and you and Zabumafu. Come along and see what's new. We're doing the things that animals do. Me and you and Zabumafu. Come along and see what's new. We're doing the things that animals do. New animal friends to see. Animal junctions, the place to be. Elephants are charging, baboons are leaping. Wild dogs running and nobody's sleeping. Me and you and Zabumafu. Come along and see what's new we're doing the things that animals do me and you and zabuma foo come along and see what's new at animal junction we're waiting for you zabuma foo yes that is correct the actor who played zabuma foo is here right now in front of me and oh my god i'm just looking back on the last few nostalgia talks and i am such a terrible host these people know, come it's, okay. it's i missed the cue and i didn't even burp <laughs> And I am such a horrible host because out of the 28 episodes that I've done, you know, my guests come all the way from Zoom just to be here. And I don't even offer them snacks. Like I've never said, here, you, you want something to you want something to eat? Like I, I've never offered them a snack. So for the first time ever, I'm going to ask Zabumafu if he wants a snack. And in the spirit of nostalgic TV shows, I've got uh, – what have we got that animals might like? Oh, okay. Can I buy the beans? Sure, yeah, I got some garbanzo beans here. Enjoy. <laughs> Zabu, that's me. I can't do the burp on cue. It took me so many times in the studio to get it. <laughs> Welcome, Gord Robertson. Hey, how you doing? And I, I completely screwed up everything, but that's okay. It all works out. That's all right. We heard the voice and that was pretty good. <laughs> so yes, Gord Robertson is the puppeteer who played Zabumafu on the TV series. And he's had an incredible career as a puppeteer. He's been on Groundling Marsh as Galileo Groundling. He played Chip on the Jim Henson Hour and was one of the puppeteers for Johnny Five on Short Circuit. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Hmm. Now, before I begin, I just have a few little things I'd like to say. Uh, really? Most, yeah, most, uh, mostly in regards to this past Saturday's show, which, uh, for anyone not aware, was a reunion of the cast of Lazy Town. I have hmm. been getting messages from fans of that show who have been saying, "Thank you so much for doing that," and honestly, that really makes me very, very happy. I, you know, because it. Oh God, how long? How long has it been since the, that cast got together? And they've even said, you know. We have, we have never done this before. And I'm so happy that I got to host the Lazy Town reunion. It was one of the happiest moments of my life. And I awesome. actually, I just found out that it's in a vlog. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Chloe Lang, who played Stephanie on that show and was on this podcast, posted a vlog and showed a little behind the scenes of me and the other cast members of Lazy Town who came on waving and saying hello. And if anyone is interested in seeing that, just click the corner of the video to see a little behind the scenes look at nostalgia talk and that my friends is a little story i like to call why it's okay to be happy in the middle of a lockdown <laughs> <laughs> and especially since i passed all of my classes for then it was my last hey. year of college as well are you did you say you were first year of college final final year what were you studying i was studying film oh awesome and with from what uh perspective from writing from directing from technical crew from acting well we've gotten to do a little bit of everything my main you know my main goal like what i really want to do is write and direct yeah uh, but, I, but we've all gotten to do a little bit of everything that would you know what that would be my advice to anybody if you want to do anything in film start by writing because mm. you learn so much it's the thing it's the it's the advice i wish somebody had given me at the beginning of my career oh wow <laughs> yeah 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 no seriously wow all right. So uh, also at the very end of this episode, I'm going to make a little announcement, but right now I am going to stop rambling and get right into the interview. Gord, <laughs> Gord sorry for the long intro. Oh, well, it's all good, man. I, it's, it's always nice to hear what other people are up to. Oh, I love it. I love it. 
All right, so uh, let's start by going back a few ways. How did you become interested in puppetry? Um, I first started uh, being interested in masks. And uh, masks was one of those things that uh, when I discovered masks, I, I didn't know what they were, but I just w were, was taken by them. And uh, so I went to a, uh, a mime school called the Mime School Unlimited here in Toronto and studied mime and masks. And uh, I had no idea what I was going to do with it. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't, I remember telling my dad, my dad ran an art gallery and, and uh, I remember I coming home and saying, dad, I want to go to mime school. And my dad was reading the newspaper. He ran an art gallery, so he knew all about the arts. He's reading the newspaper. He doesn't even look up and he goes, well, Gordon, there's many ways to starve. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. And, but yikes. No, but he, he paid the tuition, totally supported me, didn't know what, what I was going to do with it, um, but was totally supportive of it, both my parents. And um, I think just because they, they were in the arts, they supported starving artists, we, whether they were sculptors or, or painters. I mean, that was their, their interest. Uh, so they knew the landscape. And I, and it's something that can't be understated how valuable that support is. You know, you just said to me that, that you're, you, you went to film school and it's amazing to me that your parents supported you with that, whether they supported you financially or not, um, they are behind you in some ways, or I'm presuming they are. I mean, you're oh, yeah. Sitting, oh yeah. You're sitting at home. You got a you got a radio. You got a a microphone. A podcast. It's amazing when parents can support that. I got a dog here who just had surgery, who oh. who may interrupt us, but that's okay. It's all right. I I got a dog. Uh, I got a dog at home as well. And um, whenever I'm finished recording, I always introduce the guests to my dog. <laughs> so. Perfect. So may, maybe they'll get to meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's kind of a, maybe a long-winded way to ask how do I, I got into it. I mean, so to finish that part of the story, uh, I went to mime school, and then I got a job at a th as a backstage sort of theatrical stagehand for a part of a show, and I met somebody there, Rob Mills. He introduced me to a friend of his, Trish Leeper. And the three of us started a, a, a mime company. We were going to change the world with mime. And, um, you know, we were trying to do school shows and wherever we could uh, do shows. And then the Muppets came to town and uh, were looking for people. I would have, you know, heard that, seen that and said, oh, wow, somebody's going to be lucky because I would never have had the, the chutzpah to, to call them up. Rob read the ad, called them up and said, we want an audition. And uh, so we went and auditioned for the Muppets and got a job. We were really, really, really lucky. Nice. And was that for Fraggle Rock? That was for Fraggle Rock, yeah. Nice. I've had a couple of uh, people from Fraggle Rock on this show mm. as well. But actually, the first guest who came on was Mike Peterson. Oh, awesome. Very mm -hmm. nice man. And very oh. good here. Oh, yeah. And a great teacher as well. Like, I've learned so much from him. Nice. Mm. And uh, Tim Gosley was here not too long after. Very nice man as well. Yeah, both both uh, great puppeteers and really really nice guys. I mean, I I uh, I think that's in a sense one of the one of Jim Henson's great talents was um, attracting or hiring or surrounding himself with really good people. And I have um, I have really fond memories of every single one of the people who came out of Fraggle Rock across the board and fond memories of them as just being great people, just really good people, no two ways about it. And um, as well as being really talented um, artists. Nice. Yeah. So what was Jim Henson like to you? Do you have any little stories about him that you'd like to share? Um, Jim was, like, okay, so you have to, you have to understand. I was, uh, I don't know, 24 years old and I had never done anything. Like I had never done anything. I'd never been in, in a TV studio. So I think for the first maybe month, whereas everybody else in the studio called Jim, Jim, 
I called him Mr. Henson because oh. I was terrified. And he never, I mean, he never said anything until finally um, I got sort of relaxed or comfortable enough that I could call him Jim. And he was, for a young guy who didn't know anything, he was a little bit terrifying, but that's all my stuff. That wasn't him. He could be seemingly inscrutable, um, but that was, but he had, he had a sense of humor. And I, I don't know how to tell this story um, because a lot of it was kind of from my perspective. But I remember one day on set when, when you know, further along, I, you know, I worked with him, with the rest of the team for, for many years. And, and he knew he could, at the, by that point, he knew he could sort of like poke me and, <laughs> and that I wouldn't break down and cry. And, and so he had this sense of humor where I remember one time we were doing this group scene and we were surrounded by this set. So there wasn't a lot of room physically to move. And I had to make an entrance with my puppet, but it was so tight, I couldn't get out of the shot. And Jim, he could have helped me out. He could have said, okay, well, let's move that set piece. And he just kept saying, oh, no, you got to, uh, no, you got to get out of the, sh the shot court. <laughs> and, and I'd be like, I can't, I, I don't have nowhere to go. Oh, uh, well, we're rolling and we, you got to get out of the shot. And I mean, and he really, he was cracking up. And I think everybody, if I remember, everybody was cracking up at me trying to somehow, I don't know, lean over backwards and get out of the shot. So he had this, this kind of, um, what's the word? I don't want to say devilish, but, but, you know, really kind of, he would, he would kind of poke you a little bit and, and this really nice uh, trickster sense of humor, um, which was fun to be around. Um, but, but my, a lot of, especially my early memories are just being kind of in awe. And that was totally for me. That wasn't anything. And here's the thing that wasn't anything from him because going back to what I said about masks, I was so interested in masks. I started making all these masks. And at a certain point I had a lot of masks. So I decided because my parents ran an art gallery, I had the idea, well, why don't I do a show? Why don't I just do a mask show of them? as pieces of art. And so I put it on and it happened to be um, at a time when I knew Jim was going to be in, in town. So kind of as a joke, or not a joke, as a lark, I sent him an invitation. I'd made up these posters and invitations. Well, he came. After oh, work one day, he and a bunch and, and some of his, you know, Steve Whitmire, and I can't remember who else, came, came to the gallery. And I was oh, like, wow like, you know, blow my mind. But, he, but that's the other thing about him is he was always interested in other people's work. He was always interested in his performers. If they were doing other gigs, he was interested. And let me tell you, as, especially as a young performer, that is amazing. It's amazing support for you as an artist. You know, if I go in, which I did, and I was a background to start, I was a background performer, and yet the boss, the Obi-Wan boss, is interested in coming to my little mask art show. That's a huge ego boost. It's amazing, it's amazing. That is incredible, wow. Yeah. What a great story. When I, when I was doing uh, the show with the Lazy Town cast, David Matthew Feldman, who was, have you ever seen Lazy Town? I have not. Okay, it was a kid's show that combined live action and puppets. And uh, David Matthew Feldman, who's one of the puppeteers, told a little story. He was saying that um, he met Jim Henson as a kid, just briefly, and then invited him to his bar mitzvah. Sweet. Mm -hmm. He didn't end up coming, but it was worth a shot. And you know what? I mean, um, some, yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. Mm. I think it's fantastic. And, and, uh, I'll bet you that if uh, Jim had been in town, he would have gone. <laughs> no, probably. So, David, if you are listening, just remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with what you were saying about Jim having that kind of trickster personality sounds more like something Frank Oz or Richard Hunt would have done. Um, Richard especially. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard was lots of, lots of fun and very gregarious. 
Um, Frank, I didn't know, I didn't get to work with uh, that much. I didn't know him uh, well at all. So, but I've heard uh, that he had that similar side of him too. Um, I only know, if, yeah, from Jim, those, those, uh, uh, those times when he was quite playful and um, uh, kind of imp not impish, but anyways. Uh, mm. Yeah, and uh, Richard, we, I knew, got to know a bit more. Uh, he was sort of, I think because he auditioned all the puppeteers and he was, I think unofficially, maybe the puppet captain, um, which was a term that wasn't really around then. Um, mm. But Richard was lots of fun too, and very, but much more gregarious. Mm. Um, again, another, uh, another fine human being, really, really mm. good guy. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good stories about him as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and he was, and he was so funny too. Like his characters, and no matter what it was, his characters were so crazy. Yep. Yeah, mm. Mr. Energy and and lots of. Uh, um, I have this great memory of him, of Richard coming in hungover one day. Oh my god! <laughs> and picking, and as he picked up his puppet, um, just saying kind of to himself, but out loud, "Oh, why did I pick a profession where I have to be happy all the time?" <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And for any of the listeners who don't know, uh, on Fraggle Rock, Richard was Junior Gorg, which actually leads me into my next question, which is uh, you, were the, you were the body puppeteer for Pa Gorg, right? Correct. And Jerry Nelson, who, of course, was Richard's BFF and performing partner, uh, they, like anything on Sesame Street that Jim and Frank didn't do, Jerry and Richard were doing. And um, yeah, Jerry would be, from what I've seen, would be offset uh, using a Waldo, uh, which yep. is a remote control thing, to do the facial movements for uh, Pa Gorg, and you were inside of the body. Did you find that a challenge? Um, absolutely. I mean, again, coming back to being as new as could be, uh, and then throw me inside a, a big bodysuit, and especially this first season, um, the, the way we, we could see was right, uh, sort of in where your third eye is, uh, they had a little fiber optic cable, um, on, on Pa's head. So right where Pa's third eye would be, there was a little, mm, call it a lens with a bunch of fiber optic cables together that came down into an eyepiece that went over my eye. And the vision was kind of like, um, it was very, it was honeycombed because it was all these fiber optic fibers and everything looked about, mm, if I remember, maybe three feet further away than it actually was. So there was a learning curve where I walked into a lot of walls um, just because I didn't realize how close they were. Um, so that was challenging. And I remember, I remember every, I think that at the end of the first season we did it. And then the, at the end of the second season, I, I remember putting on the, the head and going, oh my God, how did I ever see in this thing? But then, you know, you, you, I would get uh, used to it. And then I think probably halfway through the second season or maybe, maybe in the third season, I can't remember. They actually put a little camera in there and uh, that made things a whole lot easier because you could actually see there was a little a little uh, um, camera lens out here uh, coming into an eyepiece here so that was much much better um and at first uh it it took a little bit of uh there was a learning curve where it took a little bit to to how do i say this to learn how to work with jerry in the sense of he, you know, I had to listen to him and he had to listen to me. Mm. And I remember, I think I remember the first time I did it, I looked at the script and I was so green. I thought, oh, well, he's the one who does the dialogue. So I just have to wait and listen to him and, and go. Well, that was a, wasn't a big mistake, but it was kind of a mistake <laughs> because it put me always a beat behind. So after that, I started learning the lines. And I know that some of you are going to listen to this and go, well, that's the most obvious thing in the world. I was young. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it just seemed easy. Oh, Jerry's got all the lines. He's doing the voice. It's all good. Um, and so my performance got a lot better, if only because then I wasn't waiting, but I could anticipate. And and that's a that's the dis the the difference is a hair, but it's a hair difference in in your in everybody's timing. And so then instead of me waiting for Jerry we were we were riding each other's energy and uh that's the best way i can put it um and i can remember i can remember some scenes especially where there was if there was a scene where there was a flow i could remember like almost feeling really feeling him um it's a really cool experience when you when you when you have that kind of a relationship uh, you know, I'm listening with every fiber in my body. He's watching uh, like crazy to see what I'm going to do, um, especially if I have, you know, we'll do a rehearsal. But what if I have, what if I hear something in his voice that makes me just put a little bit more into something, either into a reach or a or a sway of the hips that, that gives more attitude. And then he's seeing that and maybe amping up a little bit. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, performing experience. Nice. And you also were the body puppeteer for Daddy Dodo in Follow That Bird, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What, was that, what was that project like? Because that was, was that actually, was that your first film? Uh, no, I think Short Circuit was my first film. Okay. I think I have to go. I, I, I don't honestly remember the, okay. I remember two things about, uh, uh, follow that bird. Okay. One, I got one of the, one of the best notes or, or, or critiques that I'd ever been given. And, um, and it, it comes with what I just was talking about, uh, working with somebody and we were doing a scene and, um, at the end of the scene, and I think Frank Meshkalite might have been doing my face. I'm, I can't remember now. Um, and Kermit Love, who was, an, who was a long time builder at, uh, at Henson. And for any of the and, listeners who are wondering, no, Kermit Love was not, was not the name basis for Kermit no. the Frog. No, no, no. Uh, Kermit was, was a, a name from, from that from, uh, uh, bygone era. Kermit was a an older man with a white hair and white beard and uh, uh, came from a really old tradition, older theatrical tradition. Um, but he, he sent, after this take, he said to me, you have no constancy. And I kind of tilted my head and looked at him and went, no consistency? He said, he waggled his finger and said, no, no constancy. You don't do the same thing twice. And I went, oh, now, that can be an interesting trait in a performer if you're performing by yourself. But when you're performing with another performer who's depending on you for his or her uh, cues and performance, especially in a bodysuit situation where there's somebody doing the voice and the face and you're doing the body, you have to be constant in what you do. So the choices you make, or you have to articulate them. You know, you have to say to somebody, "Oh, you know where I where I uh, on the line? What are you doing?" And I reach out my arm. I'm not going to reach out my arm, my right arm this time. I'm going to do it with the left because it's better for the next action, or it's better for lighting, or it's better for whatever reason, so that they know, and they're not caught off guard. Or you know, maybe a hand in, is not the best example, but maybe it's a head tilt or a head turn or something like that, where it really can affect a facial performance. I mean, it's also, you know, it's a good note in, for any actor. You know, there are certain things that actors need to do. They need to be able to hit their mark reliably, reliably over and over and over and over again. That's the most basic thing. Um, so anyways, that, that I al have always remembered that note. Um, and just before I leave that one, and there is, Lots to be gained by people. I know some performers who never do the same thing over and over and over. 
because they're always exploring and that has its own value too. But for me at that time, it's a note that's really stuck. The other thing I remember about that gig is that it was hot as hell. I have a picture where we're outside and I'm in the picture in the suit with my head off this with the, with the, the, the dodo head off. I'm in full like foam and feathers. And, and at that time I had been training uh, uh, for a marathon. So I was running every couple of days. I was uh, every second day I'd run 10 miles. So I was in good shape. So I'm in this suit <laughs> and everybody around me is in either shorts and no shirt or shorts and a tank top because it was so freaking hot. I would put that suit on and the foam was right up against my, my face. Oh. And, and so I'd run, I'd do the scene and I was in good shape. And then they'd pull the head off and I'd be sitting there going. <gasps> <laughs> Those are the two things I remember uh, about that gig. That, that is funny. That is definitely funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, and uh, uh, since we're talking a little bit about uh, stuff having to do with Sesame Street, another project that I really uh, enjoyed was uh, Basil Hears a Noise. Oh, okay. Which was you. the Canadian Sesame Street special. Yep. Did, uh, and Kevin Clash was doing Elmo in that one. Uh, what was yep. it like to, I, I, I can't remember if you were in it or not, but if you were, what was it like to have Kevin there performing Elmo for the Canadian Sesame Street? I don't remember much about that uh particular show i mean uh for canadian sesame street i was brought on as a puppet coach early on and then um they and then i did some incidental characters and some and some background uh, some arm work and stuff like that i remember kevin mostly from um uh jim henson hour mm -hmm. and and other projects and in fact um and, and I always found Kevin to be a remarkably talented, but be also really generous and um, really generous and really supportive. I, I, I have lots of um, lots of time for Kevin um, and, I, and I'll always have kind of a. Um, uh, I always have space in my heart for him, because when Jim died, uh, Kevin was the guy who called and told me. And uh, that was a huge, I don't want to say job. That, 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 was, that was a hard thing. That was a hard phone call to make. Mm. And he did it. And I always appreciated that he called me. And um, so, yeah, so I have, I have lots of time for Kevin. I know, yeah, um, but I don't remember I don't remember um, doing, see, seeing him with Elmo on Basil Hears a Noise. I think I might've been on it, but I don't remember. Um, I do remember he, I was working on uh, nin the Ninja Turtle movies, uh, I guess number two, and he came to do uh, uh, da, 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 the name just Splinter. went out of my head. Splinter. And one of my friends was there with their kid. And Kevin said to the kid, hey, come here. And the kid went over and uh, he, he did Elmo for him. Oh Just my like, God. yeah, totally, you know, un, you know, asked for totally. And to me, that's a total act of generosity. The other one, the other really generous thing I remember when, um, when uh, Being Elmo, the movie came out and they had a showing for it here in Toronto and uh, Kevin sent a bunch of us invitations. And so we went. That's lovely. And uh, so we went and uh, at the, the, they showed the, the uh, film and it was great. And they brought Kevin up on stage to talk. And before he started his talk, he said, uh, there's a bunch of other fellow puppeteers here that I've worked with on Fraggle and Jim Henson Hour. And uh, where are they? Stand up. And, and he got us all to stand up for a round of applause, which to me was the most generous thing you can do. It's his night. 
he doesn't need to get us up and 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 recognize us and he did uh, so really nice man really really nice man talented performer amazing performer and um and really generous mm. did you by any chance hear that there's a fraggle rock reboot coming out i did hear that yeah, did. they're they're filming it in calgary at the moment yes uh, i was called about it and unfortunately i was busy on some other stuff mm. sucks it would have been cool to see, to see you back there dancing your cares away. <laughs> uh, you know what? They got a, a really uh, talented crew there. And um, uh, I think it's, and most of them are new. And I think that's going to be fantastic because they're going to, um, they're going to, I think the show will benefit from having new energy and, and a new, perhaps a new take on it. So I'm really excited to look, to see what will come out of it. Um, I think there's one, I think, yeah, I think it's mostly new, new puppeteers. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what will happen and, and um, jealous that, of all the guys who uh, uh, were free to work on it. <laughs> so um, uh, since you mentioned the Jim Henson hour, that actually does go into my uh, next question, which was uh, about the character Chip. Yes. And that character was actually modeled after uh, Bill Prady, who is uh, a writer for Jim Henson. And for any of the listeners who don't know who Bill Prady is, this is interesting. He was the co-creator of the Big Bang Theory. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a nice credit to have, huh? Yeah, well, I, I'm a huge fan of the Big Bang Theory. I've been watching it a lot. I actually just did a video recently with my uh, best friend, Sean. Yeah, she lives overseas. And it was 20 minutes of footage of us. Uh, basically, it was a quiz. We were seeing how well we know each other. And then, we <laughs> had, and then we got 90 minutes of small talk after that. I wish I was recording because <laughs> we're both huge fans of the Big Bang Theory. And I said to her, Who, who's your favorite character? And she said, Sheldon. And I said, OK, can you imagine me coming to your door in Edinburgh or wherever you are, whether you're back home in Singapore, which is where she was born and raised, or back here in Nova Scotia visiting family and me just going knock 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 Sean knock 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 Sean knock 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 and she's like I'd go James slap 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 James slap slap slap. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about doing Chip? Um, well, Jim the Jim Henson hour was a really uh, was was a fun show to do, and I'm sorry it didn't have more legs. Mm. Um, it was an interesting show to do, especially because of the blend of things that was going on with it. Um, Chip and Lindbergh were the two characters that I got. Um, honestly, so Chip, I just wanted to model him on a, on kind of a computer geeky kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so that's where I went with it. Um, I remember actually being, it's funny because I, th I think in some ways, more people remember Chip, but I remember being more preoccupied with Lindbergh. Oh, really? Mainly because Lindbergh had this, I don't know, foot-long nose, this foot-long beak. <laughs> now, you tell me, if you're a puppeteer in a group scene with a character that has a foot-long beak and everybody looks from left to right, how do you turn? Mm -hmm you're going to hit some character in the head. Mm -hmm. So I remember, you know, trying to, to navigate that, that uh, beak. Um, but uh, Chip, Chip was a fun character. It was a fun, uh, the, I liked the voice. Uh, I remember the, um, often when I'm getting a voice, latch onto a catchphrase, the was is God. That was, was kind of, the was is God was my kind of, catchphrase to try and get into chip um and he had a nice eye blink right um so yeah hmm. did you happen to see the uh, abc muppet series that uh was on a couple of years ago uh i saw some of it and um another one that i was really sad that uh it didn't uh, didn't get more attention and wasn't wasn't renewed because i thought there was some amazing uh, really subtle and amazing puppetry going on there and some really fantastic choices. I mean, um, yeah, some stellar work. Ship uh, was used quite a lot on that show. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, you you will see some some puppets uh, recycled and uh, and they show up in different episodes and and uh, you know why not? Mm. Dave Goals did him for uh, that series and he really made him funny. Like there were there were moments where he'd come in and it would be like, "Who are you? I'm Chip. I'm the IT guy." Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, you also were on the Muppets 30th anniversary special. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to celebrate such a big franchise? When I had Tim Gosley on here, I asked him the same question and he's like, oh, I just went, oh, great. I got a gig. What was it like for you? <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny because I think, uh, I think for many of us, that's our first reaction <laughs> is that we can pay the rent, you know? I mean, here's the thing. Uh, when I tell people I'm a puppeteer, often their first question is, you can make a living at that? <laughs> it's true. Um, or, or the second reaction is, uh, oh, you like kids stuff? Uh, oh, hold on, there's my dog, who's just in a little bit of discomfort because of her operation. Come here, huh? So, yeah, I mean, there's some of some of that reaction. I remember that the, the, it was pretty big. There was a there was a lot going on. Um, I didn't have a lot to do. I think I might have been in a suit for that, but I don't remember. Uh, I yeah, I think we were at that point. We a lot of us were kind of the background chorus and. Um, so in some ways that becomes a, a blur of, of production numbers and, and filling in spots here and there and uh, um, that kind of thing and being happy you got a gig. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Uh, moving on a little bit from the Muppets, when I announced this uh, show, a lot of people were interested to hear about... Um, Groundling Marsh, where of course yep. you were Galileo. Yep. And I had never actually seen that show uh, prior. I watched a little bit of it. It was it was amusing. It was yep. it was amusing. Um, do you have any funny little behind the scenes stories from Groundling Marsh that you'd like to share? I'm sure a lot of our listeners might be interested. Well, I think uh, Groundling was a was a, a fairly ambitious show. Um, they created a really nice world. Uh, there was some great characters on it. I mean, I'll always uh, remember um, during the auditions, they were talking to me a little bit about other puppeteers and they were having trouble uh, finding the character for Echo. And they'd had some uh, very strong uh, female puppeteers come in, but nobody had quite nailed the that Echo character. And... Um, I can't remember if they had what they had specifically in mind, but I said I said to them, ask Jim Rankin, and they they said, well, he's a guy, and I said, yeah, and he's a guy who does amazing voices, and so Jim did this elderly English woman, and they were like, oh my God, yeah, sold. So um, I remember that. I mean, I mean um, Jim was very, very good vocally. I remember. I don't. I don't know if I can tell that story online. Um, I, I remember Jim uh, being stuck in stacks way at the back, and we'd sort of forget about him, and then and then we'd hear this chainsaw sound, and and we'd go, "Oh, and that's Jim. He's trying to stay awake." Because we totally forgot about stacks in the background. Um, I'm trying to remember what other. I don't. Uh, that was a fairly busy show for me because I was kind of head puppeteer at the same time. Um, so I don't. I, no funny, st- quote unquote, funny stories come to mind. I'm sure there. You know, we had lots of fun, but I, I don't remember mem- remember any off the top of my head. Okay. And uh, you also worked on Lamb Chop's Play Along, I read. Yes. What, yep. was Sher- what was Sherry Lewis like? Fantastic. Amazing. Um, she was old style. Like she came from a vaudeville tradition. And 
there was a really kind of, um, uh, I'm going to say scientific approach to comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I would say something funny and uh, either with the puppet or not with the puppet. And she'd, with a total deadpan face, she'd look at me and she'd go, that's, she'd say, that's hilarious. She wouldn't crack up. She was, she was analyzing the joke. She was analyzing what I'd said, and that's hilarious. And, and I thought that was really, I really liked that. And uh, it was a very, it was a d different approach. And um, she had lots of great stories about um, uh, just from kind of, her dad had been the New York State official magician. And nice. so she had stories from that time that she would share. And it was a really, it was a really nice job for me because I had a skill set that, that they needed and that they didn't quite have. And uh, only because Sherry was sort of locked into position with her puppets and they wanted the puppets to be able to be free from her and move. And, you know, I got that from, from the Muppets being able to move around. And so um, they really appreciated that, which was great. Um, and yeah, it was, I just, I really liked working with her um, for so many reasons. Hmm. Speaking of working with celebrities, when you did the uh, specials, Very Merry Muppet Christmas and Muppet Wizard of Oz, did you get to be in any scenes that had any celebrities? Um, I think... I didn't get too close to, to any celebrities. Those Muppet Wizard of Oz and Very Merry Christmas, those were more, uh, I was more of a background puppeteer or a, um, yeah, or incidental puppets. I didn't have a main character. Those featured mostly the, the main puppet cast, uh, the main Muppet cast. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, not so much. I think I got more to work with more celebrities on uh jim henson hour um oh, wow yeah yeah T ted danson and Smokey robinson i remember them coming in oh nice yeah yeah and Smokey uh, robinson's awesome yeah yeah and and another another really generous guy you know he we had to record a song and we were going long and he was waiting to record and they were kind of like trying to rush us through and he was like ah, don't worry about it just let them go you know get it right Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really, yeah. Um, so some, some Katie Lang came on that show and uh, um, yeah, it was nice. That's amazing. I, yeah. I do, I do like Katie Lang as well. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, and of, of course, as I mentioned in the intro, another very popular role is one of the puppeteers for, um, I almost said Jimmy five, Johnny five. <laughs> Let's see, I, I'm a fan of this show on ABC called the Goldbergs. Are you familiar with it? I don't know the Goldbergs. Okay. No. The Goldbergs is a show that takes place. Uh, actually, the uh, the creator Adam F. Goldberg uh, co-wrote Muppet Wizard of Oz. There you go. Mm -hmm. Small world. And yeah, and he um, basically the show is about his family growing up in the in the eighties, mm -hmm. and um, his uh, dad Murray apparently mispronounced everything. Like the word robot, he pronounced it robot. Of course. And um, Star Wars, Space Wars. Of course, I remember one episode. They were uh, they were having a they were like uh, the the mom apparently had a habit of cursing a lot. It was always getting bleep, so they started a swear jar. And it's like, okay, well, for you, we have a batitude jar every time you lip off, and for you, we have the atom <laughs> jar every time you bring up something about space or robots or space robots. Yeah, 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 so it's yeah, just yeah. a nerd jar. But there was one episode where Adam, uh, it's a character, it's somebody playing uh, the real Adam. Adam was very uh, uh, like uh, intrigued by short circuit and wanted to create his own uh, weather reporting robot. Nice. <laughs> and the dad was calling it Jimmy Five, so that's why I almost said that. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, doing? I almost said it again. Jeez. <laughs> doing Johnny Five. Yeah, Johnny Five. I mean, I think that was uh, my first film. And, uh, you know, God love Jim Henson. He, he heard that uh, they were coming up to Canada uh, to shoot the second um, uh, short circuit movie, uh, I guess, the, uh, and, and they were looking for Canadian puppeteers. 
And so he recommended uh, Rob and Trish and myself because they needed to be a team. And, uh, you know, of course, we had worked together as the Gorgs. And so um, Rob and Trish worked on the head. And uh, I worked the uh, telemetry suit, which ran the arms, the hands, and the, and the body. And um, it was a good gig. And uh, actually, I've just been communicating with uh, Kenneth Johnson, who's just put together a, a whole package of DVD extras and stuff for a re-release of the movie, which is coming out soon. I can't remember when, in, uh, on a Blu-ray. Um, with, uh, I think lots of extra behind the scenes stuff. Wow. Um, but that, that was a, that was a steep learning curve just about the film industry and the expectations and professionalism and, uh, uh, really, really good gig for, for the three of us because we, we were pretty tight as a team. And so that was a nice way to come into the film environment which can be, uh, you know, pretty intimidating, and when, especially when you've got, you know, guys who've been there for a while who, and time is money. And um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a slightly different environment than television. Uh, many of the same things, but it can be slightly, um, uh, but it is slightly different. Um, but yeah, good gig and, and Michael McKean and Fisher Stevens, amazing people to work with, really generous performers. Uh, I always say that, so that that film has the, holds the record, holds my personal record for most number of takes to get something. <laughs> 32, 32 wow. takes to get something, yeah. There's a scene. For a single where, scene, 32 takes? One scene, Ooh. 32 takes. Yikes. Yeah, who is right? Uh, there's a scene where Johnny Five has to hand uh, Michael uh, a can of Coke. So the robot, remember the robot is, is you know, plastic and metal. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting across the room, so 20 to 30 feet away, trying to pick up, and it was an empty Coke can, and give it to... Uh, Michael, well, first of all, it, I swear to this day that the, the, the tele telemetry suit was not uh, repeating its motion 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. It probably was, but I swear that I was having issues with it. Second of all, it's 20 feet, so, dis so uh, depth of field for judging distance is challenging. Third, the Coke can was empty. If I so much as touched it, instead of getting it perfectly in the outstretched pincer, it would fall over. Mm -hmm. So we did, I don't know how many takes. And then I finally said, guys, you, you got to put something in the Coke can. you got to make it a little bit heavier. I know you're worried about the weight of it because of the arm and, and the, the weight of the arm and picking it up and with the Coke can. So they did that. And I think it must've been more than, I think it was maybe 10 takes. Anyways, that once we did that, I got a lot closer. Um, but it took 32 takes before I could get it. And um, every take, Michael McKean was there, present with his line. And he never once grew impatient. Never once. Nobody else gave me a hard time. And when I, and I remember Eric Allard, who was, whose company All Effects built the robot. Mm -hmm. He wasn't on set at the time. He was, uh, I think he was back in the shop on the onset shop doing something. Anyways, when I saw him after, uh, I was, I was kind of like, you know, in a cold sweat because it had taken so much time. And um, he said, did you get this, get the scene? I said, 32 takes. And he just, he didn't, he didn't say anything. He just said, did you get it? And I said, yeah. He said, great, moving on. And there was a wisdom to that. First, there was a generosity that he didn't say, you're an idiot. How come it took you so long? But there was also a wisdom. Yes, time is um, important on set. Like it's, it's hugely expensive. 
sometimes there are unavoidable things. You do your best and that's what it takes. And when the movie comes out, if it's good and you got it, nobody cares. Hmm. To a point, to a point. What we just got here was a big arts lesson right there in performing <laughs> filmmaking. Wow. It's amazing. Well, I tell you, it, it, it certainly, um, uh, it, it's a lesson in humility too. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. So um, last uh, thing I want to, last project that you worked on that I want to bring up, I saved the biggest for last. And if, uh -huh. well, I mean, I did it in the intro, but that's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, which is, of course, Zaboomafu. Awesome. And actually, uh, can I tell you a funny little story? Absolutely. So as I said, last week I did a little Lazy Town reunion and my first friend, Rachel, uh, she lived across the street from me. I did another one of those challenge videos with her as well. Okay. And um, I, uh, I told her I was doing a Lazy Town reunion. And then when I finished recording, I actually heard from, from you about uh, a date for doing this. Uh, for any of the listeners who don't know, Gord and I have been talking about this for a while, but you know we've, we've both had other obligations, which I understand. Uh, so it's only just recently that uh, we decided to do it this day. And um, I, we confirmed it just after I got out of the studio for the Lazy Town reunion. Nice. So. I finished and um, I texted Rachel, guess who's up next? And she said, who? And I said, Zaboomafu. And she's like, and the Krat Brothers? And I'm like, no, sorry. So <laughs> I, I guess people's hopes are kind of getting up that I'll do more little nostalgic TV show cast reunions. If we can do a reunion of Coach or the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, then I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I have Craig T. Nelson's autograph. Craig T. Nelson is, of course, the coach. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Ho ho hopefully that'll be helpful. Uh, yeah, that'll get you in the door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how did speaking of getting in the door, how did you uh, get your foot in the door for the role of Zubumafu? Um, auditioning, like everybody else, and um, uh, you know, putting on the puppet and working with animals, and um, and coming up with a voice, and uh, you know, the the way we always audition for puppets. Um, yeah. Was it the Krat Brothers who were doing the auditioning? Uh, the Krat Brothers and I think Leo Eaton. Um, I, I'm trying to remember if they were there on the day they must have been to see how uh, we would work together. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it was just to see how we would handle working with animals. Um, and, you know, I kind of got lucky. Uh, a buddy of mine, a very good uh, puppeteer, Frank Meshkalite, he, <laughs> the puppet he had to work with was a cougar. And um, the audition puppet was nowhere near as realistic as, uh, the, as the Zabu puppet that we ended up using. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was more cartoonish. Um, and uh, e even so, when Frank pulled out the puppet, the cougar, uh, grabbed the puppet's head with both paws and Frank said he could feel the claws coming through the puppet's head. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. 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 Try not to pee your pants on that one. <laughs> your puppet here. Um, and uh, when I went to audition, there was no cougar. There was a uh, camel, which was not going to wrap its, hand pause on my head and rip my hand off um so a little bit e perhaps easier but I, I think it mostly came down to as often does with uh puppets with the voice mm -hmm. uh and as a sidebar i think that's that's one of the uh innovations that the that henson and the muppets realized and instituted i don't know if that's the right word is understanding how important the voice is to the puppet. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've heard the stories about Miss Piggy and, and about Elmo and how about how they were originally done by other performers. Oh yeah, I know that stuff. Yeah. So, Richard Hunt originally did uh, both characters and Frank and Richard kind of alternated Miss Piggy. And uh, my favorite story I've ever heard about, about Richard when it comes to that 
is the Elmo story. He was yeah. doing Elmo. Yeah. Uh, and I, I always love showing my friends the videos of Richard doing Elmo just to freak them out. And it works. They <laughs> actually are frightened. So yeah, yeah. it's one of my favorite things in the world, freaking yeah. out my friends. So yeah. Richard, uh, for anyone who hasn't heard that story, Richard had the Elmo puppet. He's basically carrying it like a dead body. And he um, get, tossed it to Kevin Clash. And he's like, you do this damn thing. I'm sick and tired of doing this character. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm. So um, uh, I think that's how I got the Zaboon Fu role was is by voice, and um, uh, and it turned out to be a really, really, really interesting gig and a challenging gig. Um, yeah, and lots of great stories from that from that show. Mm. Did the voice come from anyone that you knew? I think the voice came more from the crap brother direction okay they really wanted something uh in the higher register and with lots of excitement and okay. so i worked on those two things and then the, the the thing that took the most amount of time was the laugh and the laugh um they kind of locked me in a room and we all and i remember just going through so many gymnastics to try and get that laugh and the laugh is actually done with an with an exhalation. Uh, so something like, uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. That's the kind of the Thank closest. Uh, so is it exhalation or in? Sorry, inhalation. Uh, I force all the air out and then I do the laugh. Oh, nice. Yeah. So wow. um, yeah. So that that was. Uh, Fascinating working with all the animals, sometimes a little bit terrifying. I was just about to ask that. Um, so I remember one time they brought in these um, young, in quotation marks, tigers. And they were like, you know, there was just one. They, uh, no, they brought in tigers on a couple of different occasions. But I remember the, they brought in one that was, he was only 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they were, while we were waiting to kind of amuse him, they were throwing him soccer balls. And every time he would catch them, they would just deflate because his claws would come out and crush them. Jeez. And so they, they, um, they cleared the inner set. And I think they might've even had him on a, on a 10 foot chain or something like that, buried under the, um, under the, uh, the mulch. And off camera, they had an, an animal wrangler. But mm -hmm. let's be honest, if the, if the tiger decides to go, good luck. <laughs> so there's just the cameraman, and then they get me to walk in, and they tell me not to get too close to the tiger. They want to keep me away from the tiger. Okay, fine. So I lie down because I did all my puppetry lying down so that Zabu could look like he was sitting on the floor. And so I had to put my elbow on the floor and I, you know, I do my scene and it's all good. And the tiger is just calm and that's fine. And then I get up and I leave and I go, Oh, well, that wasn't so bad. And then I realize I'm completely soaked in sweat. Oh, that's nervous energy. I can, I, I can tell. Yeah. So, um, you know, or the, or, <laughs> or the, they had a bear escape from the studio one time. Um, and the studio was in the middle of suburbia. Mm -hmm. um, that was fun. Uh, we're, we're, so they, they had this bear who I think might've been a retired circus bear, but he was a little skittish and a bear is a bear, mm -hmm. retired circus bear or not. And um, so they cleared out, and this was another one. They didn't often do this, but every, for, every once in a while, I think I remember one other animal uh, Wolverine that they cleared the in, the inside set out of. So they cleared out the internal set uh, and they had Chris, I think, or maybe Chris and Martin and the cameraman. That was it. And I'm standing backstage and the lighting director is lying on a sofa and we're looking at the monitor to, to watch the scene. And uh, we see the bear enter the shot, stand up, drop, turn and run and then he's out of shot 
And all we hear is clack, 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 clack of his claws running on the pavement. And oh. we, hear, we hear his trainer say, just stand still, just as the bear rounds the corner of where we are. And I'm looking over the lighting director and he's looking at me and we're both tele tele telepathically saying, well, I'm just standing still, how about you? The bear runs past me and there's a big, you know, like a big dryer vent, but a big like two foot round vent to bring in cold air because it was summer. Mm -hmm. He crushes the vent and then gets out of the building. <laughs> just as he does that, the trainer comes around the corner, says, where's the bear? We look at him and we, I say, he's outside. Outside where? Outside. Holy sh**. So we all go out running, looking for the bear in the middle of suburbia. Oh my God. It turns out the bear, the bear t went the only good direction for him to go. He, there was a fence alongside the studio between the studio and the house next door. He ran alongside the fence back to his trailer. So he was fine. Oh my God. It was, it was fun. It was fun stuff. Oh, geez. That would be friggin' scary. <laughs> oh. Yeah, lots of, lots of good stories, with, animal stories with that, uh, with that show. Um, lots of... Um, Lots of actually amazing footage with the Krat brothers who were really kind of fearless with the animals and, um, you know, things that I, I would have, I really would have peed myself if I'd had to do it. Um, I don't blame you. You know, they, this cougar that I told you about earlier that my fr friend Frank auditioned with, they brought this cougar on set. And so I knew about it and um, I thought, okay, well, the, the cougar, likes the puppet so in a way that i don't want it to like the puppet so they had a shot where i i had to s the cougar they had a shot onto the cougar and they wanted me to they wanted to shoot it over zabu's shoulder onto the cougar and i had some lines to say i had to turn the camera and say something so i said to them okay i walked on set with the puppet behind my back so the cougar couldn't see and i said okay roll camera and they said, rolling. And so I lay down, got myself into place. The moment I pulled out the puppet, the cougar turned to look, got up and started walking. Toward because, the puppet? Towards the puppet. I said my line, pulled the puppet down, got up and walked out just as the cougar got to where I was. By any chance, was it that cougar that was in the intro for Zabumafu? There was a yeah. cougar that... Wow, yeah. I will never look at that cougar the same way the show. <laughs> I'll just think I'll just think when it's walking, it's going right near Zabu. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was a good show and it was also a good show um for any anybody who's a puppeteer who's listening. A good show to learn about body mechanics. And what do I mean by that? I mean how does the puppeteer uh, how does the puppeteer's body position affect their puppetry? So what do you do with your body when you, so for example, I had a, there's a scene where they're shooting, they're looking in to the cave that was built into Zabumafu. There's a cave opening and they wanted a shot where Zabu was sitting in the cave opening. Well, on a Muppet set, they would probably, uh, it would be elevated so I could just stand and put my arm up. But this was not elevated. So there was a floor. There's a floor and there's a wall right beside it. I have to hide my body behind the wall. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? And show and have the puppet right sitting on the floor, which means my elbow has to be on the floor. Right. The only way that I could figure out to do it was I did a shoulder stand with my feet going up the wall. So picture me on my shoulders, kind of like a headstand, but a shoulder stand, flat up against the wall. I'm, in a sense, my body is facing backwards, 
and the puppet is facing forwards. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, that's one that's easy to visualize, yeah. uh, but it can be done. I had to do a shot where I was doing, I don't know if you know the position, the yoga position, the plow, where your feet are over your head. Oh. You're lying on the ground and your feet are over your head. I did that to do a shot. It was the only way I could get my body out of shot. So I learned lots about body mechanics, uh, little things like from everything from those kinds of extreme things to little things like the monitor I would look at, I would tilt on its side. So it matched the angle of my eyes. Mm -hmm. So, so lots, lots of good learning on that one. Mm. So uh, before I uh, make the announcement, uh, what are you working on right now? Uh, working on, uh, I just did a, a bunch of stuff on uh, a show called What We Do in the Shadows. Mm -hmm. There's a little, there's a doll uh, that comes to life um, called the Nadia doll or Nadia doll. And uh, so it's a really fun uh, role. Uh, also been doing some stuff at TFO, Tele Francaise Ontario and uh, working in, uh, with a French crew and uh, they have a couple of English characters. Uh, so it's been good, it's been busy. Nice. Well, that uh, wraps up the uh, chat with me and you and Zabumafu. Is there anything <laughs> else you'd like to say? No, what a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for your interest in, in my work. No problem. And now the big announcement. So if any of you listeners follow the Nostalgia Talk Facebook page, link in the description, uh, you probably remember a while back I did a live trivia night. And a lot of people showed up to that. A lot of people really enjoyed that. And I, as I said before, I'd like to do more of them. And when I asked in the video, what kind of trivia would you like to see? A lot of people said Disney trivia. And so I am excited to announce that Thursday, May the 6th at 7 o'clock p.m. Atlantic Standard Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's going to be happening on both Facebook and YouTube Live. So you know where to go, facebook.com slash YouTube and this YouTube channel as well. Awesome. And yeah, so if you want to check that out, I will see you on Thursday, May the 6th. And before then, there will be a new, brand new Nostalgia Talk bonus video coming out. And I will see you then. Peace. Peace out.